It sounds simple. Prayer and love and the love of God and what is the love of God, right? And the love of God is different from our love, right? Our love, our humanistic love. Um, and so we need to learn about his love, right? And, and but I'm going to start with this. I'm sorry if I'm a little broken up. I'm, I, I, I'm so shaking. You guys, please have mercy. Bear with me. So we're going to start with um, Revelation 5.8. You guys heard me say that. I'm just going to quote it. This is a recap. I'm just going to quote these. Um, and uh, we need to, how do I start a, a life of worship? I put the worship music on. I don't hear anything. Well, your heart has to get, get aligned with his. He is the truth. So the, but when Jesus said the true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. So that means you have to be in his spirit. And he is the truth, which means your heart has to align to the truth. I don't know if you've ever noticed it. Whenever you've had an encounter with God, you could put the worship music on. You could be praying. It's the moment that you mean what you're saying and it's aligned to his will that he shows up. That's when you start to have an encounter. What is an encounter? I could explain many things, but one way I will define it as we, we all know how to pray. We all know what worship is, but an encounter is when God answers back. Now, that could be through his word. He convicted you. And you know it was him. Um, it could be the presence manifested. It could be um, through prayer or you feel, you know, but it's basically when God answers his back. So I'm just going to say this before I move on. If you want to learn how to get deep in worship, you need to learn how to get personal with God. And the way you start to get personal with God is prayer. That's how you talk. You just talk, express your heart. And then there's also the asking aspect of prayer. That's a different kind of prayer that I explained as well, which is you do not have because you do not ask. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be open to you. Right? Those that diligently seek me, find me. Um, I'm not saying this to be scandalous or controversial. For some reason... Um, and, and, and it's not popular now to speak about being diligent to seek God. I don't know why it's just not popular. Everybody, nobody wants to talk about that we need to pay a pay a, You don't need to pay a price for his acceptance. You need to pay a price for his presence, right? It's biblical, New Testament. Those that diligently seek me, diligently. I don't know why we don't like talking about that. Um, let me tell you something in the, in the East, in the Eastern world, if you're a Christian, that's not something offensive. In, in the underground church in China, you better be diligent to seek God and pray. You don't have a choice. In the underground church of Iran, Persia, which is the most fasting, the fastest growing church, you better see, there's no, that's not abstract to them. For us, that's abstract here. Um, and so people don't want to say diligent. You need to be diligent. You need to be, so this is what I've said before. You need to use your strength to get to the point you no longer need it. What does that mean, right? Even the youth shall utterly fall. Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles, which means you'll glide. They will walk and not grow weary. They will run and not grow faint or run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. Um, and that's what happens. It's happened to me. You pray, you pray, you don't know what to say. You, you don't know what to pray, but you're consistent. You're consistent and then you're, and you're consistent and you don't go back. You don't take a sin break and you're consistent. And when you're consistent, boom, there's a point you end up praying an hour and you don't know what happened. You, you mount it up on wings like eagles. He's the wind, right? So that's not going to happen if you don't have an asking life. I also said this. You grow at the, at, the, at the momentum of your prayer life. Your prayer life defines how fast you grow. You grow at the, at the speed, the speed. Your prayer life is the pedal, right? The word of God is the steering wheel. Revelations 5.8. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So the 24 elders, right, that are at the throne of God, that are with Jesus in the throne room of heaven, the 24 elders, they present to, the, to, to Jesus, they present to, the, to, 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 to God, they present the bowl of the saints, the bowls, I mean, sorry, a bowl that has the incense of the prayers of the saints. We are the saints, right? You grew up understanding that a saint is somebody that is made a saint by the church. That's not biblical. The Bible says when you're born again, you are a saint. What is more holy than the Holy Spirit? Who is more holy than the Holy Spirit? How many more works do you have to be to be more holy than the Holy Spirit? If the Holy Spirit comes into you, the Bible says we have placed, he has placed this treasure in earthen vessels, right? This is what he did from the beginning. He took dirt and he blew in it, right? We were made out of dirt, right? Which, by the way, for every skin color, there's a color of sand, right? Because we're made out of dirt, right? So he took dirt, blew in it, 
Hello? And so this is why a tree is often a representation of a man because it's a seed in the ground that bears fruit of its own kind. So that's what we do, right? He, we were in the dirt, he blew, and we bear a certain kind of fruit. And so he, he keeps, the, so we're saints. We're all saints based on the New Testament, right? The Bible says you are a royal priesthood, right? You are a holy nation, a royal, a, a royal priesthood. You're the righteousness of God. So um, because he made you that, not because of your works, because he made you that. And so what happens is when it's saying here, the, 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 the prayers of the saints, it's actually saying that, like, why would prayer be stored? Like, why would God store prayer? Right? Like, it's interesting. Like, shouldn't a prayer just go up? And if the answer is yes, it comes down. Or go up if the answer is later. Okay, then, then later. You know, or just if it's not his will, just not happen. So it's like he's, he's storing these prayers so that he can pour out the answer, it seems, at the right time. And the elders are presenting it to him. Why would they present it to him? Like, in other words, like pleading with him or, 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 or standing in the gap for us in a sense, right? Obviously, we cannot pray to them. People take that and they're like, oh, you could pray to them. The Bible never said that. We only pray. There's one mediator between man and God, the Lord Jesus Christ. But what happens is they are presenting the, the, your prayers. And it says incense because incense represents sacrifice. Like there's a sacrifice, right? Whether you're sacrificing time, you're sacrificing something, there's a sacrifice in the prayer. So that's why it's, 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 it, there's incense and it's in a bowl for God to pour it out. Meaning, meaning there, there are some people that I've seen uh, 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 get discouraged, uh, you lose faith, and then walk away from the Lord. But those, those prayers didn't dissipate. They didn't disappear. The prayers they prayed are waiting. And so this is why I've seen that they'll have a, they backslid. And maybe that's some of you here. Maybe your parents served God and backslid. And, and, and that's Erica's case. They backslid, meaning they left God. That One of their children gets saved and starts walking in what it takes somebody 10 years to walk in in one year. This happened to Erica, right? Because her grandfather uh, planted churches in Dominican Republic. And then her father backslid and she got saved. And super fast, God did things super quickly because she obeyed. So what happens is the prayers don't disappear. That's my point. That's the, the point of what I'm saying. The prayers don't just go somewhere. Whatever you pray is an eternal investment. Eternal investment. Okay? So a lot of us, we understand natural investments. Imagine a natural investment where you never lose the money, right? Like a trust fund. It just builds and builds and builds and builds. Hello? So that's what prayer is. Every prayer you pray, every prayer you pray with faith Right is, is something that God stores and he's waiting to pour it out at the right time. So this is why the enemy, the enemy doesn't want you to know this. He doesn't want you to think that seconds of prayer could change things. Prayer with the right heart is, is undoable by the enemy. Prayer with the right, when you make a decision, you've heard me say this many times, but I'm going to repeat it. The angel of the Lord came to Daniel and told Daniel, who was already a practicing prophet. So a lot of us think just because we're seeking the Lord already, we're, our heart is completely right. But Isaiah in chapter 6 was already a practicing prophet and still had unclean lips. Are you guys catching me? Or no? Okay, so, so just because the, God had to work in, in, in him, God had to work in them, right? And so, so he keeps the, 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 the prayers of the saints, the 24 hours fall down and they present it. I love that it says that they present it with a harp. With a harp, meaning like there's worship, worship and prayer, worship and prayer, worship and prayer is very, very powerful. Hello, like it's, it's, this is what makes God manifest. So Daniel was already a practicing prophet, but the angel of the Lord comes to Daniel and says, as soon as you made a decision in your heart to obey, your prayer was answered. So there's some of us that are praying prayers and God heard you and, and you keep praying the same thing and God is like, bet, bet, yeah, <laughs> you know. It's already, yes, you're praying my will, yes. But the thing is, I can't pour it out yet. Because I'm waiting for your heart to shift. I'm waiting for something to happen. You know, like, God is not going to empower the enemy. What do I mean, empower the enemy? If there's immaturity in our, in our life, you heard me say this, the Bible says, do not separate the weed from the tear. The tear is a baby wheat. I know these words sound the same, maybe I'm not pronouncing them well. You know, wheat, W-H-E-A-T. So a tear is baby wheat. Did I spell it right? Oh, thank you. A, 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 a tear is baby wheat. So do not separate the weed, right, W-E-E-D, from the, from the wheat. Because an immature Christian looks like a, a, a sinner that wants to sin. 
It looks like the same thing. So don't separate them yet until it bears fruit, right? And so, so this is what happens that, that um, when, you, when your heart, there are things that God is waiting to do, but he's waiting on you to say yes to certain things because he's not going to anoint something the enemy is going to use or he's going to anoint something that's going to destroy you or damage you. Now, oh, but aren't there people that are anointed that don't have the right character? Yes, because they, that's all they pray. God, use me. God, use me. God, use me. And they're not interested in changing. So God allows it, anoints them for those that will change. Because anointing is, is to be used by God to serve others. So the more you serve others, the more God anoints you. So that's why somebody that's just serving, serving, you're going to get more anointed. But it doesn't mean that you have the right character. And so God wants to, he, he wants us to be sons and daughters, not just workhorses. The Bible says you're not just servants, but sons. A servant doesn't know what his master is doing. How do you know somebody knows God? Revelation. I can't do a revel, I could, I could, I could impart it, I could pray for it, but I, it's not the same doing a, a, a spirit of revelation activation. I've done it many times and it's difficult to see fruit in that because that comes from fearing the Lord. It comes from the spirit of the fear of the Lord. It comes from depending on God. Depending on God, it's saying, God, I don't know better. Therefore, delete what I think I know. And then God's like, since you deleted it, now I'm going to fill it. Luke 6.38, I'll just read that to you. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full. Press down, shaken together to make room for more. My Lord, give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full. Pressed down, your gift will return to you. Your return to you. This, this word gift, often in the Bible, is also, is also contextualized as sacrifice or spoken of as sacrifice. Before you come to the altar and give your gift, some say before you come to the altar to, and give your sacrifice or give your offering, make sure your heart is right with your brother. And why? It's, a, it's pleasing to God. It's incense. It's a sacrifice. It's something that you give, you're, you're giving up. And so it's saying, listen, don't think your gift is going to return to you. Your gift is going to return to you. Hello, that's what it's saying in Luke 6, 38. It will return to you, press down, shake it together uh, 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 to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Luke 6, 38. That includes faith. The woman that gave her last two coins gave more than somebody that gave a lot of money because she gave it with faith. And it was sacrifice. It's all she had left. Jesus spoke about that. So when you give with faith, when you give with... And this is not just talking about finances because right before this, Luke 6, 37, it's saying forgive and you will be forgiven. So it's not talking about finances. It's a principle of what you give. Forgiveness. Do you give forgiveness? Why do I keep having warfare? Because you're not having mercy. If you have mercy, what does that mean, mercy? People do you wrong, you forgive them. You let it go. You don't repeat it. You don't slander. You don't gossip. You don't go to other people and talk bad about it. You have mercy, so mercy is given back to you. Do you want to cut an evil harvest of people gossiping about you? Stop gossiping. The enemy loses legal right. And then if it still happens, God defends you quickly because there's no legal right. I don't know if you guys caught that. But these, are, these are keys. These are keys. I've seen it work. I've seen it operate. So you stop gossiping. That's it. Okay, I'm going to take it to the Lord. Gossip to the Lord. That's not gossip. It's holy. <laughs> you know, he, he, it goes in his ears. It becomes holy. Stop Gossip to the Lord. Bro, this person, Lord, my God, I'm tired of it. Or whatever it is. Or whatever it is, you know, they took my money, you know. I don't know. Whatever it is, I don't know. You know, and, and like, like, like David, right? He said, my complaints are many. My enemies are many. Right now, they're, setting a, they're building a trap for me right now. They're waiting for me outside. Boom, boom. He's saying all these things, but God turns it into something powerful. The, David didn't know. David, Satan did not know how to stop David. Satan did his best. He did his best. He, yes, and, and he set a man up to be killed. David set up a man up, a man up to be killed. And he took his wife, which is mentioned in the, in the beginning of the New Testament in the book of Matthew. God didn't forget. He just forgave. Right? And people are like, oh, but he, 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 for, he forgets. Yes, he forgets the offense. But that was Uriah's wife. And so it says it. David with Bathsheba, Uriah's wife, begat Solomon. It says Uriah's wife. You know, so what happens is because that's holy. Marriage is holy to the Lord. So this isn't just talking about. This is money. It's a principle of what you give. What you, what, you know, when you give mercy, you're going to get mercy. I don't know. Psalms 138, 3 to 5. I'll just read it to you. In the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. Why is it when we were in the world, and this is some of us, and the cops were on their way, or you were drunk and you were high, but you cried out, God answered. Well, number one, he had mercy 
Number two, he wanted you to understand that you need him. Number three, he wanted you to understand that if you cry out to him, he will answer and he will change your life. He didn't want you to just do it like 911 and just use him as 911. He wanted you to have faith that he's there for you, right? And for you to surrender your life and trust him. But here's the thing. Crying out is another form of prayer. Some of you have not cried out yet. What is that crying out with all your strength? Lord, I cry out. I cry out to you. God told Moses, I'm lifting you up to deliver my people because I've heard their cries. A cry is doing it with all your strength. You know, Lord, I'm not going to leave here till you show up. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you, God. It's only a matter of time if you mean that. Crying out is powerful. Crying out to the Lord, it, it, it shakes the spiritual world. See, what happens is a lot of times when we were in the world, we cried out because we were desperate. And the Bible actually says, it says, in their anguish, they will cry out to me. In their suffering, they will cry out to me. Why? So that you don't have to need suffering to know how to cry out. So that you don't have to be in a pit for you to, for you to know how to be pulled out of a pit. So that you can understand that he's there and that you could trust him with your whole life. Not just a moment that you need him. You need to give him your life so that you don't fall into a pit again. And so it says in their anguish they would cry out to me. And why is it saying that? Because God was talking in the Old Testament about his people that weren't seeking him or crying out to him when they were not suffering. And see, here's the thing. God wants to bring revival, right? We're always seeing words of revival, songs of revival, you know. But the thing is, there is no revival without holiness, without obedience. And so we keep singing these songs of revival. God wants to bring revival while we're blessed. But what happens is most of the time we get too comfortable. And like, and like, and like the people of God, the Jews in the desert, they, they, they wanted to worship the gold. And so a lot of times we get comfortable, we want to worship the gold. And you forget the pleasure of, 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 of walking in sacrifice. Some of you have never known it. You don't know what I'm talking about. But those of you that have, you understand that there is pleasure in walking in sacrifice. There's pleasure in being a living sacrifice. Hello? There's, there's pleasure in walking in the fire of God. So you forgot what that's like. And so what happens is God wants to bring revival and he wants to bring change and he wants to bring all these things while we're blessed so that we can use the blessing as another weapon. But what happens most of the time, the blessing is drowning us. So God has to allow some persecution or God has to allow some suffering because we get complacent and we're not doing the things he commanded us to do. You can say I'm an introvert. I don't like evangelism. Evangelism is a commandment. It's not, it's not a suggestion. Oh, it's for the, that's, that, that's the Western world church. We're so comfortable. Oh, the evangelist, that's, that's for the, I'm not an evangelist. I'm called to soak. I'm going to stay here and soak. Where, where is that a commandment? Uh, uh, you know, where does Jesus say soak? Well, show me where he said that. And I'm not saying that, that don't, it says dwell, it says abide. And so I guess you, that you could use another word and say soak. But that's not, that, that's a calling for all of us, just like evangelism. And here's the thing, if you were soaking and you didn't come out and want to win souls, you didn't encounter God. Because God is love, and that's what we're going to get into, God is love. So God has to give. Love has to give. This is the way love works. This is the way love works when you are blessed, when you are saved, when you're delivered. You can't help but think about others. Because the more you love, the more you see others as yourself. The more you love, the more you see other people just like you see yourself. And that is its own power for you to walk in freedom and stay on fire. When you see other people as yourself. This person that I just ran into, burning in hell forever, is like me. Can I imagine myself in darkness, burning forever? What, what will that cause me to do? Cry out. God, no, have mercy, God. When you love, when it's, when it's, you see people, when it's their brother, when it's their sister, they're crying out, their tears, they want everyone to pray. When we're filled with the love of God, we see everyone like that. That is its own power. Some people could evangelize out of, out of an anointing to evangelize. And, and I'm sure God will use it. But there's something more powerful than the anointing to evangelize. And that's the, the, the compassion that they are where I was. 
So when they offend me, I've been cursed out. I've been confronted. I've had knives pulled on me when I'm evangelizing. I had people curse me out to my face. But what happens is when, when you know why you're there, when you know who you are, you're under a different influence. You're not interested in, well, let me, let me win in the flesh. Let me resolve this in the flesh. No, because there's a different enemy that I'm fighting that I need to win against. And so what happens is, I don't know if this is making sense to anyone, so that's what love does. Love, the Bible says, weep with those that weep, rejoice with those that rejoice. So love, it makes you see people as you see yourself. Let me tell you something. Someone that walks in the love of God does not need to pray to be used by God. And, be, and praying to be used by God is a good thing. I still do it. I'm not saying it's bad. It's, I still do it. But when you are walking in the love of God, the Bible says, and these signs will follow those that believe. The signs will follow you. You don't got to follow the signs. The signs will follow you. Why? Because you already are following the person. You already know the person the signs are giving directions to. Why do you need to follow signs if you're following the person the signs are giving the directions to? Did you catch that or not really? The signs lead to a location. You know the location. So the signs should be following you because you are walking with the location. Psalms 34, 17, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The righteous, righteous. The Bible says Abraham believed God and God counted it as righteousness. The righteous are those that are in right standing with God because they believe God and they agree with him about who he says he is. So remember, we've talked about this in the love of God, how God wants to love you. And in the book of Revelations, he says, come up here, my beloved. He wants to romance you. He wants to woo you. But there's something that sometimes we miss. I guess I missed it even. That when he's saying, come up here, my beloved, he's also saying, come to my standard. I'm not going to go to yours. Come to my standard. And I love you in my standard. God will go to you and go and be with you in the pit to have mercy and love you. But that's the pit is not his standard. I don't know if you know. He'll go to, to, to he'll love you in the pit to bring you out of it, to bring you to his throne. Amen. And so in his throne, he's saying, come up here, my beloved, come up to where I am. I am God. When you make a decision to adjust to me, then you will see me. When you make an, 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 a decision to obey me as I am, who, according to who I am, then you will encounter me. But as long as you want me to be who you want me to be, number one, that's not love, so you're not really being loved. A lot of us, I'm just going to say this a little bit, I don't want to harp on this, and I definitely don't want people to think that I'm condemning anyone, but what happens is when someone becomes a narcissist or falls into narcissism, number one, it becomes an addiction. Right? I don't know if you guys know where narcissist comes from. It comes from the Greek mythology of Narcissus, who would look, gaze at, his, as, at, at how good looking he was in the water, and his reflection of the water, which was just Satan talking about himself. Because that's what happened to Lucifer. He looked at himself and saw he was a beautiful angel and said, I will go and, 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 and be like the most high. And, right? <laughs> he just saw himself, which is why not just you, me too. So when I say this, understand, me too. You and me need to be careful at looking at ourselves too much. Hello? We need to be careful at looking at ourselves. That's why Jesus said, do not glory in that you have power over demons. Glory that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Meaning you wouldn't even, not only would you not have power, you wouldn't even be included in, 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 in my kingdom, let alone have power. They're listening to me, by the way, not you. So what happens is, we need to be careful to not look at ourselves too much. And so, this is, what, see, when someone becomes a narcissist, their idea of love is affirm me in me being the main, main character. When you no longer want to support me being a main character, you don't love me. Get out of my life. Or get out of my life or I'm manipulating you. Because I have to be the main character. That's narcissism. Because narcissism, and so what happens is when someone is narcissistic, you can be careful because you almost can become immune to receiving the love of God. By the way, when someone is narcissistic, they never are. You're the problem. When someone is narcissistic and you tell them they're narcissistic, it's because you, you envy them. That's how they interpret life, because you're hating on them. So we have to be careful that we're not falling into that. I know this is a little bit crazy, but we have to be careful. I don't know why I'm talking about this, but there's usually a reason. We have to be careful uh, falling into that, 
I didn't plan to talk about that, into narcissism because I've seen it that when you try to love someone narcissistic, they don't receive it as love. You can go take a bus three miles to spend time with them. They don't receive it as love. What they receive as love is, is when they're getting the applause and you're supporting them getting the applause. That's what they see as love. Oh, you love me. Oh, you love me. You love me, you love me. But they don't see the other things as love. They don't see you praying for them as love. They don't, see, they don't see those things as love because main character syndrome. So what happens is appreciation gives us the ability to receive love. So when you don't appreciate what God did, that's why we enter his gates with praise and thanksgiving. We enter his gates with praise and thanksgiving. Because if, if you've heard me, if I appreciate, if someone does something for me, uh, gives me, gives me a little bit of their drink, and I'm like, man, thank you. Then, then, then what I think is, oh, he has love for me. But if I'm entitled, like a lot of people are nowadays, oh, yeah, whatever, yeah, oh, oh, cool, man. But see, what happens is this is something that I learned. It's very difficult. I'm saying this for you to pray into it. It's very difficult for someone to become appreciative that doesn't know how to. And if you are dealing with someone that is not appreciative, you need to pray, pray for them, fast for them. Because it, 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 I, how, how, do you, how, do, how does that happen that... There are people that feel like, see, when people complain, you've heard me say this, it's a reflection of what they think they're entitled to. And when people are humble and appreciative, it's because they don't think they're entitled. And so they treasure. And so that, that's how I was. When, when I was a kid, you know, when I was really young, we were poor. We didn't have snacks in the cupboards. You know, I didn't have all of that. So when my friends had all the snacks, I lived like not too far from here in a broken down building that's still there. And we didn't have a lot of snacks in the cupboards. And when my friend had all the snacks, I was like, yo, what, what is that? Like you have like several different chips, like it's crazy. You know what I mean? And then they would give me like some chips or whatever. Like I'll be like, so thankful. I didn't have a pool. So when I have friends with a pool, forget it. Like my head would explode. So I appreciated that, you know? And so little things, I appreciate little things. By the way, I'm not saying that I've arrived, but what I'm saying is the more you appreciate, the more you love. How about that? The more you appreciate, the more you're going to be loved by God and the more you're going to experience his love and the more you're going to be able to love others. See, Jesus said, those that are forgiven much, love much. Why? Why do they love much? They appreciate. I shouldn't be forgiven. And the appreciation leads to greater love. Also, appreciation amplifies your ability to enjoy something. I don't know if you caught what I'm saying. If you appreciate little things, you enjoy it more than the person next to you that doesn't, that doesn't appreciate it. It's almost like a superpower. You're going to have joy when other people don't, don't have joy. Just because the sun came out, you're happy. You appreciate the sun came out. I don't know if you guys heard what I said. God wants you to think like that because the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust alike. So God is saying, be happy that it's raining. Ha, <laughs> Psalms 34, 17, the righteous cry out and the Lord delivers them out of the trouble. See, here's the, so the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with that stage of prayer. When you cry out and you do it with your heart, God's going to answer. God's going to answer. And so this is what we need to do. We need to cry out. Now, if we're praying something and we're crying out for something that's not his will, then he'll probably reveal it's not his will. And if you cry out enough, he'll answer why. I've had things in my life that didn't make sense and I asked God why. And I knew God was saying no. I just acted crazy see here's the thing the bible says all the ways of man are pure in his own eyes but god tests the spirits we're always right i mean look at social media everybody's right all the time it's incredible everybody's a prophet every single person the bible says all the ways of man are pure in his own eyes we always think that we're loving and we always think we're loving good people but see what is love according to the bible right love is the ability to let go jesus told his disciples Many have left me. Are you also going to leave me? Saying you can go. He was willing to let them go. Why? He already had let himself go. I don't know if you guys caught that. Jesus had already died to his own interests. And he was truly free like we talked about. Like Apostle Paul said, I've learned to be content in all things. Having and not having. That's not like, oh yeah, I've been poor, but were you content? I learned to be content in all things, meaning I'm not controlled my emotions. This is why the enemy is having a field day with some of us, because we're controlled by circumstances. And that's where his power is. He knows how to change circumstances around. He cannot affect the word of God. He cannot affect someone that abides in the word of God. He cannot affect someone that is under the influence of the love of God. He cannot. He has nothing to say to that. That's why Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego told Nebuchadnezzar about this, O king, we have nothing to say to you. We will not bow to your idol. 
And even if God, and God can deliver us from the fire, but even if he doesn't deliver us from the fire, some of us need to be willing to be thrown in the fire, and that's the problem. We're not experiencing the fire, God, because we're not willing to be thrown in the fire. We're not willing that people reject us. We're not willing that people, you know, we're not willing to be thrown in the fire. We're getting there. I'm going to, I'm definitely going to expound on this on on, on Wednesday. So I I skipped the Elijah thing. And so what we were talking about was the outer court. I'm just going to do a, a brush over it. Although it's extremely profound, but that may be some of the problem. So anyway, so the Garden of Eden had the tree of the, 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 the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil to one side, and then the tree of knowledge of life, I'm sorry, the tree of life to another, and the, the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And so theologians say that the tabernacle of Moses was designed in that way. So the tabernacle and the temple of Solomon had an outer court a holy place and the most holy place. The most holy place is where the Shekinah glory, where God would manifest. So the outer court, they say, represented the same way the the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil was by the side, like uh, east to west of the tree of life, that the temple was designed that way. So that the outer court represents the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, and the holy place and the most holy place represent the tree of life. And so we today are the temple. And we have this battle. Are we going to eat of the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil? Let me tell you something. This is crept in the church. And we'll be like, oh, no, never. Yeah, right. This is crept in the church. And what do I mean by that? It's I'm going to figure it out, not trust God. I'm going to figure out. uh, I need to date five different people in the church because I need to figure out who's best for me and not trust God. God made you. He made you. You need to let go and let God. He designed you. That's part of one of the, the things that we described as the freedom of God. The freedom of God is letting go of your plan, taking his hand, and letting him reveal to you and blow your mind and reveal to you who you are and who he made you to be and what it is you truly like. And then he blows your mind. And you're like, God, I didn't know that I would like that like that. Yeah, you see, because I made you. That's the thing. So what happens is it's the freedom of allowing him to reveal what he predestined you for. Instead of you figuring it out, and the enemy is very crafty. If you're not in the spirit, you're not going to out-hustle the one that invented hustling. Jesus said he's the father of lies, meaning he gave birth to the concept of looking like the truth, sounding like the truth, with an ulterior motive. He gave birth to that. Never existed. I'm going to sound like I mean this. I'm going to look like it. That's not what I mean. Jesus said you're the father of lies. He gave birth to it. We're not going to outsmart him. We only think that we are. And that's why he's able to outsmart us when we're not in obedience to God. Because pride is before the fall. Pride comes before the fall. And pride sometimes is I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, or or whatever. You know, that's that's the pride we recognize. And we can recognize it. Maybe we'll have a prideful moment and be like, I was prideful. And then repent, I had that moment. You know, it is what it is, you know. Like, we can recognize that. But a lot of times pride in us, and I'll include myself, is just being assuming very strongly. I'm going to be alone with that girl, but we're not going to have sex. The devil loves that. It's true. You're not. You're in control. You're strong. You're a man. You're mature. You're an adult. The devil walks with you like that. Yeah, you're an adult. Hey, you're a man. You're going to listen to a pastor or somebody tell you how you're a man. You're a woman. You're an adult. You're not going to fall. Come on. How many times have you been there? You haven't fall. Yeah, but how many times were you seeking to obey God and you were alone? Ha. Huh. That's different. Now it's more valuable to the enemy. Now, 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 now he knows that when you, when you see God, God is going to do something new in your life and he's not dealing with the same person. He's not dealing with the same awareness. I don't know if this is not popular, right? You guys don't like it? <laughs> you guys don't like it, huh? Right. That's what happens, right? The greatest trick of the enemy is to, is to, is, is to convince people he, he doesn't exist. Oh, I'm not here. You guys work it out. You, you, I'm not here. Work it out. Meanwhile, it's demons that are increasing the passion and making it more pleasurable. So you're agreeing with demons. Yeah, it's cool because since it isn't the will of God, it feels better. So uh, I'm not going to be with you forever, devil, because, you know, hell is hot. But I don't know if you guys are understanding what I'm saying. This is the power of deception. So pride comes before the fall. And pride is just assuming, no, I got this. I got this. No, don't worry. No, I know. I know. <laughs> Sometimes it's very gentle and sweet. So it doesn't look like, but yeah, I know. Yeah, but, you know, it's good. I got to take them home. <laughs> Yeah, right, bro. And the enemy's there. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is um, Revelations 11.1. 1. See, God has to open our eyes. 
God has to open our eyes, but we have to allow him to open our eyes. And this is what happens, man. Some of us are like Cypher in the Matrix movie. You know what I mean? I know this steak is fake, but it tastes so good. Some of us are like that, and so we're, we're, we're letting the enemy close our eyes. But see, there's consequences that we're not seeing. And God has what is best for you, and we're praying for the best, but we hate the test. The test is going to give legal right for the thing you're praying for. Don't hate it. Don't hate the process of the thing that's making, giving you legal right to have what you've been praying for. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God at the altar with its worshipers, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. This is an end time prophecy. It has been given to the Gentiles. So the outer court was given to the Gentiles, meaning meaning it's the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. It's, it's the place where we're not trusting God. First John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. See, this is, this is, this is what is amazing about the scripture. We could just read this and it doesn't sound, I don't know, I've read it and it just sounds superficial like oh yeah know god and his love and if you know god oh yeah cool no 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 this is the no in the bible in hebrew is jada which is an experiential knowing so i'm going to read it that way beloved let us love one another for if for if love is from god and whoever whoever loves or has experienced has been born of god and has experienced god anyone who does not love has not experienced god because god is love in this, the love of God has been made manifest or able to be experienced among us that God has sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Living through someone is experience. In this, and, and in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son for appropriation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we are also ought to love one another. And this love comes from experience. It's an experiential love. We need to come out of the mindset of church and churchianity. If you're not experiencing God, you're not walking in his love. You're not walking in the power of his love. You're not under the influence of his love. We were, my wife and I were in a conference yesterday. We were in a conference this weekend. And, um, and we were sitting next to these, these, these women. And one of them prayed for me. And she prayed something very prophetic. It was crazy. She even prayed for for, for something happening in LA and all this stuff. And then we're, we, when we were talking about these things and Erica had some things in common with one of them about their, 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 their Bible plan to read the, read the whole Bible by a certain time and their list and all this stuff. And it was crazy. And then one of them was saying this and one said this part of the Bible and then I shared a revelation that completed that and the scripture she said completed a revelation that I had and then we were like feeling the presence of God and it's like, bro, I don't even, we don't even know you but we feel like we know you. And this is the biblical unity. This is not, we always talk about unity, but biblical unity is we cannot be unified if we're not inside of God. And I'm not talking about believing in God. I'm talking about experiencing his love. When you're experiencing his love and I'm experiencing his, his love, we don't got to know each other. We're going to love each other because we're both experiencing the same God and the same love. So we're going to be like, man, did you experience that? Yeah, I did. Or what happened when you're, or you know what, or I felt, or I'm leaving this. I'm, God put it in my heart to set this aside. God put it in my heart for me to give this up. Really? Because God told me this and God told me this scripture what that scripture because that's similar to what he told me I didn't know that was in the Bible that's in the Bible yeah it's here oh, oh and, then, and then all of a sudden I love him he loves me we don't even know each other it happened within three minutes because that's the biblical unity where two or more gathered in my name that's what that means not this church like we're hanging out and talking and, ah, ha, 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 ha. no that's hanging out you could do that anywhere no the Bible is talking about wherever two or more gather in my name where he's manifested we love we'll love each other whether we want to or we don't. This is something that happened when I first got saved, where I was saved and I was hanging out with these people older than me. I'm like, I was like your age at the time, you know, 22, 23, and I'm hanging out with these people. And it blew my mind because even when you're 22, 23, and you've been in the world, you've experienced so much, you feel old. Maybe some of you could relate, I don't know. But you know, you, you, you can't trust your own best friend. Everyone, the people you date, everything is with a knife behind your back, you know what I mean? Everything, and you can't fully trust, you can't let your guard down. 
And so I was already, and so I got, I, I didn't grow up in church, right? And so I went to this church, and I accepted and Jesus, and it was this whole crazy thing, and I didn't even know what was going on. My mind was blown. I was overwhelmed. And I saw this guy that, to me, looked like, like, like one of these crazy, like, meth lab-having white gangsters that had, like, like, like corn rolls, right, that looked like he was so blonde it was white. He, he, looked, he looked crazy to me. He looked like he's, like, half a second from shooting somebody. But anyways, and, then, and, and I thought he was super cool. We were hanging out. And, and, and then he just starts telling me about when he was a kid, his father left, and his, and, his, and his mother was dating these guys, and they raped him. And then she, another guy came and raped him, and one after another, they raped him. And I'm like, man, in the world, you don't tell people stuff like that, especially when you look the way you look. You know what I mean? Like, roll with it. You know what I'm saying? Roll with that image. Don't be telling people, you know? And it's like, man, and it blew my mind because I wasn't used to seeing that. And then this other girl comes, and she's like, does anybody need money? And I'm like, you're playing with money? I wasn't used to seeing this, you know, and it blew my mind because I'm like, man, these people are different. Like something is going on with them. I don't know if I want to be part of this, if this is real or a cult or not, but I know these people are different. And that's how I felt. And I'm like, man, it's crazy because, because that's what happens when you're experiencing God. He changes you. He changes your responses. And here's the thing. When you get truly saved, you don't care about hanging out with someone that is from a completely different culture, a completely different walk of life. It's not like the world. Like, if you're not from where I'm from or you're not like me, then we have really, you know, I'm cool with you. We're cool with each other. But, but we're not going to just roll together that closely. There has to be some relatability. In the kingdom, the, re the relatability is you experiencing the undeniable power and love of God. And because you're experiencing the undeniable love and power of God, you connect to these people, those that in the world would have been, I don't know, you know, a, a hipster, or, and you're not, you're emo, or a rocker, or whatever, and you would have never talked to this person, but it's the love of God, and the church misses this so many times, and we talk about unity, but you forget that unity has to be supernatural, because it's unifying under a God that is supernatural. The Bible says in the book of Acts, they were in one accord, 120 of them were one in one accord. Not the Honda, but like in agreement. They were in one accord. They were in agreement. And the agreement caused the power to be manifested. And this is why we're trying to get you guys into the presence of God and learn the presence of God. Because we understand if all of us are in agreement when we're worshiping. But if we're here and it's only three of us, there's going to be a measure. But it's not going to be as powerful. So what happens is. The love of God, number one, he, he, he causes you to no longer think about yourself and to have the power to give up your needs and to have the power to not be afraid of being rejected and to have the power to say no and to have the power to say yes because now you are freed because you're going back to a power source that that girlfriend didn't quite give you and that boyfriend didn't quite give you and those people that were your friends didn't quite give you because you're going to a power source that yes provides the emotions you need but goes beyond the emotions you need see a moment in the presence of God under the influence of his love it's more powerful than any drug I ever did. One moment in the presence of God, he deals with your pain, the aching pain that you wanted to avoid when you were six years old, and he's massaging and he's caressing and he's healing the pain, and in a moment, somehow you're six years old again, and then also he's dealing with you right now while telling you about your future. There's no girl or no guy that can do that. And it's the love of God, yes, amen, and it's the love of God that allows you to love others because you can't give what you don't have. I can't love you if, my, if, my, if, my, if the measure of my self-worth is not high, so when you hurt me, my self-esteem drops. There's no way I could love you if when you hurt me, my self-esteem is affected. See, when, 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 when someone really hurts you, when we deal with rejection, you know why you deal with rejection? Self-esteem. When they reject you, you start to question your self-worth. Am I worth it? Am I worth anything? Am I, am I worth this? Should I, is it worth suffering? Is it worth being alive? And, 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 boom, and it hits your self-esteem. So you can't love them because they damaged you too much. I don't know if anyone caught. Because exterior damage could be dealt with. Interior damage is what is difficult. So we can't give what we don't have. And we can't have it if we don't give ourselves to the one who does. And so this is my ultimate point. We are all the ways of man are pure in his own eyes. But if we don't surrender to God as good of a person as you think you are, as I think I am, and we both do, as good as people as we think, this is why Apostle Paul said there's nothing good in me as part, uh, apart from Christ. He learned to not trust in his own goodness. And that's not saying that you don't have goodness. I'm not trying to condemn or judge anyone. But what are, I'm meaning intentions. But what happens is as good as you think that you are, 
If you are not surrendering your whole life to God, you are saying, I don't need love and I don't want to love. Because God is love. And if you're saying, no, that's not true. I want to love some people. That is a selfish, conditional, self-interested love. Oh, how could you say that? Only God. Only God. By the way, there's no other religion that has the concept of unconditional love, by the way, FYI. That they say, even, even atheists, I don't know if you're saying this, I don't want to get too deep. There's atheists that are renowned atheists now, that are super educated, have several doctorates, that are now, that were atheists, hardline atheists, against Christians. And now they say, I don't believe the Bible, but I'm a cultural Christian. Because it's, it's, it's the biblical belief that everyone is made equal that has made the West what it is. I don't know if you guys caught what I'm saying. Why is it that in other parts of the world, people get raped, there's, you, there's no argument. You get thrown in jail, there's no argument. You, your, your family gets killed, there's no argument. In the West, you could complain about complaining. And people don't know that that's because of the Judeo-Christian belief that we're all made equal in, in the eyes of God. Meaning, even conceptually, the love of God has changed the world. So imagine when you experience God. I'm Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. When it says no one has seen God, it's talking about physically. No one has physically seen the Father. But the Bible does say, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God spiritually. The Bible does say Moses spoke to God face to face. Because that word face in Hebrew uh, is, the word for presence of God is face in Hebrew. So you do see God in your spirit, and that's how you change. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beholding him or looking at him, we're being transformed into, into his image from glory to glory. You spiritually see him. John, 1 John 2, 12. I just want to make this clear because the enemy is the master of deception. You and I are not going to out-hustle the enemy only if we're in the mind of Christ. The Bible says you have the mind of Christ. Only if we're walking in the mind of Christ can we outsmart the enemy. I want you to understand that. Because our nature, our flesh nature is like his nature. It is like his nature. It was basically God saying, if you want to be like him so much, there you go. That's what happened with Adam and Eve. You want to be like him, there you go. But it was also God loved us and didn't destroy us and had a plan to redeem us. So 1 John 2.12, I want to say the good news is his love. He is love. He loves you. And he's inviting you. He's not rejecting you, he's inviting you. So what, what am I teaching? What is this all about? What I'm saying is, are you going to accept his love? If you forget anything that I said today, are you going to accept his love? Because his love is surrender. And if, see what happens is we want to receive his mercy and that's his love for you. But holiness is us loving him back. And so if you don't ever want to walk with him, you are saying, I don't want love. Either you're saying you don't want love or you're saying God is a liar. Oh, no, God, you're not love. There's love outside of you. He's saying our love is filthy rags. Our righteousness is filthy rags before him, and it is. You read the book of Ecclesiastes. Maybe don't if you're dealing with discouragement and depression. Don't wait till you're full of joy. The whole thing is basically saying this is vanity. This is vanity. This is vanity. And at the end, it ends with even serving God. It's vanity, meaning people use serving God for their own vanity, for their own feeling of self-worth. And he's saying there's nothing new under the sun. But here's the thing. There's always something new over the sun, which is the kingdom of God. You need to feel loved by God. This is why I get concerned when I see some people have hardness in their heart. When I see there's a hard heart. Because that means that God is not touching you. Because what happens is we all are vulnerable and we don't want to admit it. So when you're not letting yourself be touched, it's because you are running from your vulnerability. Because none of us are truly a rock without God. And so here... It's basically saying, so I'm just going to read it to you. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven, you for his namesake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him. You have experienced, you have experientially understood who he is, right? Not just experienced him once. You have experientially understood who he is. Who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the father. I have written to your fathers because you have known him. This is the one church that we could see a letter being written to them about, and it's a very short letter of what it is to succeed. Because you read the book of Revelations, and, and, and five out of the seven churches are all failing. One, because it lost its first love. Another one let Jezebel teach and, and, be, and teach sexual morality. Another one got lukewarm. All of these things, right? The dead church. But you see how easy it is to succeed in God when you have love. When you have love, the Bible says, if you love me, 
following my commands will not be a burden. So hearing this is a burden to someone that's not in love. Hearing this is incredible for someone in love. Or, 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 or better you said, someone that wants to be. But you know what? If you're here and this sounds like a burden, then at least let it be a prayer. Lord, show me what it is to love you. I want to accept your love. I repent of not allowing you to love me. I'm not talking about knowledge. I'm talking about experiencing God's presence. So I just want to repeat this. This is like the thesis statement of today, and we're going to move on. If, if, if you are not walking in the love of God, you are saying, I do not want love, and I will not give love. If, you're not, if your life is not surrendered to Christ, I do not want love, I do not give love. You could be super nice. You do not want love, you do not want to give love. Because there's an interest, there's a self-interested love. And like I said, when someone becomes narcissistic, their idea of love is different. There's, I even, I've even had to counsel people. Oh, no, but we need to give them the love of Christ, so I'm going to keep picking them up, and I'm going to keep doing this. But they're not receiving that as love anymore. They've gotten so narcissistic, you trying to be Christ-like to them is not helping. Because they're not receiving it as love. To them, love is applauding their fame and their greatness. That's not everybody's case, but that's some people's cases. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven and that you have, no, and you have overcome the wicked one. What is the wicked one? It's so significant. It's in the letter of success. Out of the seven churches in the book of Revelations, there are two that succeeded. One is the persecuted church. There's one that succeeded. But this one gets into detail. And what happens is when you love God, then you overcome the wicked one. And what is overcoming the wicked one? The wicked one is always going to set deceptive traps. That's why he wants you to sin. You see, you love sin. You can't live without sin. You think you're going to live without sin? Didn't you just say you were going to live without sin? Didn't you say that 10 times? So how many times are you going to say you're going to not live without sin? I don't know. But hey, hey, by the way, hear more sin. Oh, poo, you see, you looked. There you go. You like sin. You don't like God. You don't love God. That's the point. We can't love God. The Bible says he, we love him because he first loved us. Us falling in love with him is responding to his love for us. And, and us responding to his love for us is responding to his mercy. So that's why the Bible says you, have, you love much because you have been forgiven much. When you understand you need mercy is when, you, is when you're appreciative and you love him more because you understand you needed mercy. And then you fall in love and then he's able to love you. And then this walk becomes passionate. And yes, it's difficult. And yes, it's a fight. But it's a labor of, of love. It's a labor of joy even the difficult moments there's joy because there is not a day that God does not make himself evident in my life and I got to be clear because I know there's a lot of paradigms I, I did drugs I was in the world I know what it is but I, I got to be honest with you and that doesn't mean that I don't get tempted but I got to be real with you God is I want to be clear God is he is my million dollar check he is my 10 million dollar check he is my award in front of everyone. God is me being in a movie. God is that for me. I want you, the Lord is my witness. He is that for me. He is that for me. God is what drugs were and more. God is what the popularity was and more. God is, he is that for me. I don't need any of that. He is that for me. He is. And why am I saying this? To boast? No, to boast of my God and to invite. It's to invite and to incite. It's to let you know there is a satisfaction in God where you want him the way, and then this Bible becomes your life. Then the Bible becomes your life, and you see the Bible, and you see your life, and you see your life, and you see the Bible, and it's freedom. And it isn't something you're trying to do. When you allow God to love you, this walk becomes incredible. This walk is even the challenging moments. It's incredible what God does even with the pain. It's incredible to watch God turn what once destroyed me into power. It's incredible to watch what was meant to kill you to be used to deliver someone else. It's incredible when you understand that he's with you in your worst state. It's incredible not just that one day in the past he pulled you out of the pit, but he continues to. It's incredible to know that he's with you when you cry out. It's incredible to know that he hears your prayers, to know that he's there, to feel his peace, to understand that he answers, to be able to interact with him, to be able to know it doesn't matter that someone else is encountering him because God is with you. He's encountering you as well. He's hearing you as well. You don't have to worry. Like he told Peter, don't worry about what I'm doing with John because you know, because Peter's calling a special. Everyone's calling a special. Don't worry about what's happening with him. And when you're experiencing his love, see the Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. When you, when you understand his love, you're not going to keep being guilty about the sin over and over again. You understand he loves you. This is why 
This is why by the grace of God, for the most part, I have no fear in facing my own flaws. And you're like, oh, but you have this flaw and you have that flaw. Okay, you know, maybe it's true. Maybe it isn't. Either way, it could be. I'll pray about it. It's not a problem. When I get to the presence of God, I'm willing. As long as I'm willing to face it, he pulls it out. There's freedom. I'm not the one that sets myself free. I'm not the one that makes myself look holy. I'm not the one that does it. There's <laughs> give it to him and he takes it. And he doesn't condemn me and he loves me beyond it. This is the power of the love of God. And the Bible says God is love. He is love. So I'm not saying this to upset anyone. I'm saying it to invite you. Don't just be like, a church, like another church attender or attendee. Allow God to love you. Because when we don't surrender his life, we're like, nah, there's a little more me I got to do. <clears throat> like I heard someone say, sometimes ministry is ministry. You know, there's a, there's a little more me I got to do, you know. No, you know, not narcissism, narcissism. Jesus. There's a little more me, you know. I got to work this out. I got to win a few more fights, you know what I mean? I want to still, you know. I got to, you know, you know, get a little, get some girls, you know what I mean? Like, I got to get a few, a few more cars. I got to get, okay, hopefully you can come back. But at least if you're honest, you're not loving and you don't want love and you don't want to love. Let's be honest. Oh, of course, when I have a child, and like I said, and I'm ending with this, how many men, and some of us experience it because of sexual morality, they could not be a priest to us. Our fathers could not be priests to us because of sexual morality. Their, their pursuit of pleasure was more important than us. Oh, but they love you. Hmm. And I'm not saying there isn't some love. It's not the love of God. It's a contaminated love. I, didn't, I thought this was going to be beautiful. I don't know. <laughs> I really did, I swear. But let's go ahead and pray.